Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth meeting of the committee for 2019. Can I ask everyone to ensure their mobile devices are switched to silent? I welcome Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, and John Finney, MSP, who joined the committee this morning. Agenda item one is the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Um, this is our fourth evidence session on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Bill. Can I welcome our first panel, Dr Lucy Reynolds, Consultant Paediatrician, Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. Gillian Van Turnhout, a former Irish Senator. Matthew Sweeney, Policy Officer, Children and Young People, Scotland, uh, Children and Young People, COSLA, apologies. And Andy Jeffries, Senior, Senior Manager, Children and Families, City of Edinburgh Council, Social Work Scotland. Good morning, you're all very welcome. Can I open things off by asking whether you support the, aim, the Bill's aims to bring an end to the physical punishment of children? Dr Reynolds, if you'd like Absolutely, to start Absolutely, yes. Okay. Absolutely. I believe in children growing up in a world free from violence, and that's why I brought the change about in Ireland. Thank you. Absolutely. Experience is that other countries that have implemented this have seen a reduction in violence to children, and I think this is entirely consistent with the children's rights approach of this parliament. Absolutely, because the members are committed to the principles behind this bill and it fits within our wider work around whether that be co-signatures to the national outcomes and the national performance framework that young people grow up, love, safe, respected and realise their full respect is, um, their full potential and also the principles behind getting a right for every child. In the Thank you. Well. Can I ask um, why you think public opinion is, is so mixed on this topic? Dr Reynolds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think a lot of people, when, you know, when I discuss with other people, um, some of the things that come up are um, things like it never did me any harm or, um, you know, thinking this is what my parents did and therefore um, it's what I should do. And why would you as a parent keep abreast of all the evidence that is continually coming in. The, the College of Paediatrics, we didn't come out with our position statement on corporal punishment until uh, 2009, so 10 years ago. But we haven't made a big effort on a, an information campaign to advise uh, parents. But then that's partly because we're rather stymied by the fact that the law is giving an opposite um, view to what we would put across as the public health message. How can we be telling parents and caregivers that... Um, there is, there is no justification, there's no good, reasonable, justifiable reason to hit a child, and there are plenty of good, justifiable, reasonable reasons not to. How can we get that public, mes public, public health message across effectively when we have a law which actually says it's justifiable? Okay. Would any other members wish to comment on that? Certainly in Ireland, uh, this was also a, a question that, that was asked. Um, and, and the reality is, this is about how bringing forward how I feel I was raised. You know, I had my own mother in, in, the, in the parliament when I brought through the law because I was raised being told, you, you know, you're not too old for the wooden spoon. Uh, so it, this, me changing the law wasn't a judgment on how my parents raised me in any way. And um, luckily I wasn't hit, just to have on the record, but I was always threatened with it. Uh, but it, it was about, it's about how parenting today takes place. And that, for me, is what we need to ensure is, is as legislators, we bring that forward. So I think always looking to public opinion, when we changed the law in Ireland, we realised that it was the law catching up with how parents were parenting their children today. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? So I, th I think there are a couple of related things. One is a fear of disproportionate interference in family life. Uh, and another thing related to that is a fear of misusing resources. In other words, some people are worried that parents and children will be brought into a child protection system and will be brought into prosecutions when that doesn't need to happen. Uh, what I would say about that is in the operational job I do in Edinburgh, I quality assure every child protection concern that comes through the multi-agency process, and I do that every week with senior colleagues in Police Scotland and the NHS. Uh, so we are always looking to satisfy ourselves that we're dealing with the right things and that we've taken a proportionate response. And we already have quite a low threshold for dealing with assault against children as a child protection concern. But what I would say about that is it is correct to do that, but we try to use GERFIC and get it right with those families. So we are not bringing families to child protection case conferences. We are not prosecuting parents where what has happened is 
a relationship that's struggling or some lack of capacity or some set of stresses within a family that has led to somebody losing control. What we need to do is get alongside those families, do the right thing with them and not over intervene with them. And people will not have social workers at their door that don't need to be there because we are too busy to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Matthew Sweeney, do you wish to add anything? Okay. Um, if I can bring in Mary Fee, then please. Thank you and, and good morning, um, panel. Um, I have a, a specific question for um, Gillian. Uh, as, you, as you said um, in your previous answer, um, you spoke a bit about what happened in Ireland and you were instrumental to bringing about that change. And you said that um, it was almost to catch up on public opinion. And I would be grateful if you could give us a bit more um, information and a bit more background about how you came to that decision, what the public view was, um, the level of dissenting voices against the, the, the legislation change and what happened and afterwards. Okay. So in Ireland, uh, we had a solid evidence base of how we failed vulnerable children. We had a Kilkenny uh, incest inquiry in 1996. So if I look at where the seeds of this change in laws happened, uh, we actually, as the state, commissioned over 19 different reports on how we failed children. Uh, the report of the Ryan Commission in 2009 was quite fundamental because that looked at institutional abuse between 1936 and the year 2000. So, you know, we, ha we had a very difficult pass uh, to face up to as a backdrop. And in totality, these reports lifted a veil back uh, for us. We could see what had happened to children. We could see what had happened in families. And it was a terrain that was really closely guarded. Uh, so as a start in Ireland, in November 2012, we had a referendum uh, to uh, uphold children's rights in the Constitution because we had an imbalance that children of married parents uh, there was a higher threshold for intervening in a family than if your parents weren't married uh, because of our constitution. Uh, so we had to ensure that we put into our constitution a very clear articulation that all child children are equal uh, before the law. That uh, law was challenged. Uh, we had a referendum. The referendum result was challenged uh, in our Supreme, uh, in our High Court, Supreme Court. I'm trying to give you a very quick synopsis. Mm -hmm. It was challenged. It took two years uh, for it to go through the courts, but the challenge was not upheld. Uh, and we saw in May uh, 2015, it was ruled uh, that our children's rights were in our constitution. So that, for me, if you want to look at the resistance, it was probably built up more in towards the referendum piece. Uh, and the change in law in relation to the physical, the reasonable chastisement of children to repeal that common law defence of reasonable chastisement, uh, for me was uh, an outcome of the referendum, an outcome of all that history that we had to readdress. And that Irish people wanted to ensure that we didn't have laws that in any way permitted us to be violent against children. Thank you. I'm, ju I'm just going to um, welcome, we've been joined by um, Jean Miller, Miller, who's a head teacher at the EIS. Good morning. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, just to give you the opportunity to answer um, the first couple of questions that we asked okay. of the other panellists, and that's whether um, you support the aims of the bill in stopping um, the physical punishment of children, and also your reflections on why public opinion is so mixed. Uh, yes, yeah, you don't need to press the button, sorry, yeah. that'll come on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I do fully support the aims of the bill. Okay. And do you have any um, reflections on why public opinion is, is so mixed? I think sometimes change takes time and, and we're often brought up believing that certain things are right and appropriate. And I think that as we've seen in our schools over many years, that sometimes bringing about substantial cultural change can take time too. But I do think that uh, with many things in life, the more the evidence is presented to people, that um, increasingly people get on board. And of course, a big part of my role um, as a head teacher um, in a secondary school is about working with parents and carers um, to ensure that they fully understand um, what we see as being positive interactions with young people. And I think at the heart of everything we do in schools today, is about relationships and about building positive relationships. And I think that if we work with people and if we don't just perhaps um, pass legislation, but we absolutely work um, with people to convince them of the merits of this legislation, I think that will go a long way to changing many of the cultural norms that exist. OK, thank you. Mary, thanks for that. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure, um, Gillian, if there's anything else you wanted to, to expand on in, in your answer. I, I believe Lucy wanted to uh -huh. jump in, yes. so I'll let Lucy, if, if, if that's OK with the convener. 
It was just a statistic, which I, I, you've probably all read the equal prote equally protected <coughs> report, the systematic review of the evidence, but you may remember in that there was a big population study done um, in, in Sweden, in uh, France, mm -hmm. Austria, Germany and Spain, where they, uh, one of the questions that was asked of a population of adults was whether they considered um, that hitting a child on the face was a violent act. And in Sweden, where the law had been that you don't uh, hit children for many years, and this was well known amongst the public, 85% of, of respondents considered that hitting a child on the face was a, 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 a violent act. In Austria, uh, Germany, Spain, where they were all in the kind of somewhere in the process of either a public health information campaign and law or one or the other, you know, part way along. And um, it, it was around kind of 60-ish percent, 50 to 60 percent in each of those countries. Whereas in France, where there had been no kind of public health campaign, no move toward law, no discussion, only 30 percent of adults thought that hitting a child on the face uh, was a violent act. So the, the law combined with the, the public health campaign, although, yes, attitudes have changed quite a lot without the law and the campaign, but law and an information mm. campaign are effective in moving them further. OK. Can I come back to, to, to Gillian yes. now? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I suppose the, the other thing I would be interested in um, is the, the, the public perception before you, you, yeah. you introduced the legislation, and, and I accept that you said you were catching up on public opinion. Yeah. Was the resistance to the legislation as it was progressing um, through Parliament? Yeah, there was some resistance. There wasn't any organised groups or, 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 or civil mm. society organisations who, who, who spoke against. There was individuals uh, who spoke against the change in legislation. Mm. We, uh, did, we, don't, we didn't have the same process that you're having here of having pre-legislative scrutiny uh, in, in this manner. In fact, the day I walked into the chamber, I didn't know if I had a single colleague with me mm. uh, in, in the change of law. I was going in uh, not knowing, but actually I went in knowing that even if I was the only person who said it is not okay to hit a child, children in Ireland would know that somebody believed it is not okay for them to be hit. And I didn't mind if that was, you know, obviously I wanted to change the law. Much to my surprise, every single member of the Irish Parliament uh, chose to support the law by not calling for a vote at any stage uh, on it. Uh, so for me, it was a really collective, powerful moment. Uh, it was powerful that we did the change in law, uh, and many of my colleagues said that, on the eve of uh, 2016, uh, mm -hmm. because it's 100 years since we had our proclamation where we said to cherish all of the children equally. And that, for me, really resonated for us in Ireland. So it was quite a powerful moment. Even our Prime Minister, uh, or then Prime Minister Taoiseach, Enda Kenny, chose to spoke mm. uh, in the chamber in favour of the change in law. So we had cross-party support. Uh, now, I'm not saying it was easy. Uh, I think, to be very clear, my colleagues pulled me aside uh, some civil society organisations, uh, members of the public saying, the time's not right. We need to do X, Y and Z in order to be ready for this change in law. So let's not do it yet. We totally agree or we don't agree, they may say, but now's not the time. What was fascinating for me, it was really a light bulb moment. The second we changed our law, the same colleagues looked in the face of my face without any irony and said, why didn't we do this years ago? This makes so much sense. And I, 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 can, I can still picture them standing there saying, this makes so much sense. So, you know, changing laws like that, as we've seen in, in legislation, uh, whether it's smoking in public places, in seatbelts legislation, it is amazing the effect that when, as legislators, we are willing to step forward uh, to ensure that our laws protect all of our citizens, uh, the public do respond positively. And was that the case? The public responded positively? Absolutely. The public, uh, ab you know, if you, if you now talk to the public, they would believe this law change happened a long time ago. If you told them it was only a few years ago, uh, in, in advance of coming here this week, I contacted uh, different civil society organisations uh, or state agencies, uh, and it's all still positive about the clarity that this change in law has brought for their work. It has helped them in, in, for social workers, it's helped them with their relationship with parents because they're not, previously they said to me they had to, 
when they were meeting with parents, would start having a moral discussion about whether you can or can't hit your children, saying, well, I don't think it's a good idea. But they couldn't authoritatively. And now they say, they say, you're not allowed to hit your children, so now let's talk about what you can. Let's talk about mm. positive parenting. So it changed the dynamic of the relationship. OK, that, that's very helpful. I'll ask my second question later, because I think that was... OK. Michael Hamden. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for coming to see us today. I'd like to follow on from uh, Mary Fee's questioning with a couple of specific questions uh, for Gillian van Turnhout, but then I've got a, a couple of other questions which I hope that all the panel will be able to um, answer. And I suppose that's because um, we've heard a lot of evidence, Gillian, of um, the, the potential negative outcomes of uh, removing physical punishment from the home. One of which is the sort of protective element that uh, parents believe they should retain the right to physically uh, chastise their children for their own good. For example, if they're about to pull a pan of boiling water down over their head or run out into traffic. Have you seen a massive increase in injuries by boiling water or people running into traffic since you banned smacking? Uh, no, we have not, and equally we have not seen a dramatic increase of prosecution of parents, so just, just to be absolutely clear uh, on that. Uh, the running out to traffic argument was used uh, in Ireland, and uh, somebody on the radio very helpfully gave us the example of uh, that her, her, her grandmother has Alzheimer's, and she wouldn't think to hit her grandmother uh, running out in traffic, so why would you choose to hit somebody uh, with a similar cognitive ability uh, that's smaller. Uh, and as I debated the law in Ireland, you know, you start thinking about if I landed in Ireland and, and tried to understand the law, or law basically is saying you can hit somebody as long as they're smaller than you uh, and are more vulnerable uh, than you are. We are the rational adults. Uh, we, are, we are supposed to act in, in that position of rationality. Uh, and we have to think of the lessons that we're teaching children. So, we don't hit, you know, if you look at any of the examples of hitting children, uh, it is, it's portrayed as if it's a very calm moment and I chose to discipline my child in this way. It doesn't happen in a calm moment. It happens when we're in, irrational. So that we have this invisible line in our heads that we say, I know the difference between a smack and a whack. We don't. So for me, it's very clear that we need to ensure that if I'm at a meeting and let's say Lucy or Andy says something that annoys me, I don't immediately think I'm going to give them a bit of a whack because I don't agree with them. No, that's not acceptable. It's, it's not on. So why is it acceptable when it's a child? Because what are you telling the child? This is how you solve a problem. Don't discuss it. Don't learn to calm down. Don't learn to de-escalate. You know, I've, I've thumped the ground myself when I'm annoyed because I've had to learn these lessons in life. And this, for me, is about helping children in those really critical life skills uh, of, 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 of how you problem solve, how you deal. And also we know that when you hit a child, they immediately forget everything that happened beforehand because that person they love they cherish has hit them. So there's no connection to what they actually did. And um, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to yeah. hear this afternoon from an American academic who is very much opposed to the legislation. Um, his name is Professor uh, Lazellery, and he uh, uses the example of Sweden, which we've heard already, to denote a correlation between uh, negative social outcomes and the removal of the parents' right to chastise. In fact, he points to uh, rather quite the extreme statistic that there has been a 73% increase in the number of juvenile rapes in Sweden since 1979 when the ban came in. Um, and he says, although increased willingness to report rapes might have accounted for part of these, um, the, of this 73% in increase, it is likely because a small but increasing number of boys never learn to accept no from their mothers. Have you seen anything like that in Ireland? Any corollary between the removal of physical punishment and an uptick in juvenile violence? No, there is absolutely no evidence. And I've also, as part of my work, worked with the Council of Baltic Sea States, which obviously includes Sweden, who've done considerable work on the issue of violence against children. Um, and I have heard these spurious, I will say, arguments being put forward. Uh, and there is no evidence. I have met with people in Sweden, whether they're from the police, from social workers, from practitioners on the ground. There is no evidence for those arguments. Thank you. 
did you want to bring other panel members in on this? I wondered if, if any of the other panel members wanted to. Yes, on, on, on the, the two questions I've yeah. asked, the, uh, Gillian. Yes, um, Dr. Um, Reynolds. So, uh, this one's being a paediatrician in Glasgow and representing Sorry. all the 1,000 paediatricians, uh, members of the College of Paediatrics and Child Health in Scotland. Um, I'm also uh, a member of the International Society for Social Paediatrics and Child Health, um, which actually started off in Sweden, but now is an, you know, an international uh, organisation. We have a big email discussion group. And whenever I've posted things in relation to um, uh, equal protection for, for, for children, no paediatrician in any of the countries were, that have fully protected their children under the law have ever expressed any regrets on any of those discussion groups. Um, Staffan Janssen, who I think he's a paediatrician from Sweden, I think has spoken at the, the, the Scottish Parliament before, um, he spoke, we had a, a meeting uh, of the International Society for Social Protection Child Health in St Andrews a few years ago, and he, I suppose, really listening to him and then thinking, I really need to look into this evidence, was really the start of, of me thinking I had a duty as a paediatrician to do more about this. Um, but yeah, so I hear from New Zealand paediatricians, I hear from New, uh, Swedish, um, Icelandic, uh, Spanish, uh, German, Austrian, all of them, you know, there's absolutely no regret with, with having changed, changed the law and are really kind of looking to us to be next. And, and the countries that haven't yet changed, you know, when I've posted, there's a paediatrician in Japan is going, oh, oh, and what are you doing? And, and, and of course, down down south and in Wales and so on, they're all looking to, to, to us in Scotland to, to, to do this, to equally protect children and hope that they can then follow on. Okay, so I want to make a point in relation to your first question, Alex, which is the difference between hitting and restraint. So the example you gave, the first one was a boiling pan of water that the child pulls over. You don't keep children safe by hitting them. So you manage the environment in a way that keeps them safe, so you don't leave that pan of boiling water there, you are with that pan, you're in front of that child, it's at a height the child can't reach, and that kind of thing. You don't stop a child running into traffic by slapping them, you put yourself in between that child and the traffic or put an arm out. And I think that is an important distinction, that restraint is sometimes necessary for the safety of the child or the safety of somebody else. If children are punching each other, you would get yourself in between them, but that is not the same as hitting a child, and that is, what, that is the bit that we are saying is inconsistent with the children's rights. Do any other panel members wish to come in on that? Dr. Yeah, I, really okay. back to the, 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 I was picking up on the latter point, but the, the earlier point, sorry, as a, a developmental paediatrician, I should say something about the way that children learn. Um, and uh, from, from birth... Children learn by mimicry. You look on YouTube, it's, it's brilliant. If you see little clips of newborn babies, they can't focus terribly well, so you have to do exaggerated facial expressions. But you get a newborn at this sort of distance, and you start, uh, if, they've got, if, you, if you've got their attention, and you start doing exaggerated facial expressions, sticking out their tongues, they do it. It's magic. It's, well, it's not magic, it's science. Whatever, but it, 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 you know, they do it. Um, and also later, another thing on YouTube, if you, if you were to put in Bandura, Bobo doll experiments, so he, Alfred Bandura was a, a, a child psychologist, um, but the experiment is basically that you have two groups of children. You have a room full of a whole variety of different toys, and you show one set of children before they go into that room uh, some film of an adult picking up a toy mallet and whacking nine bells out of a... a a kind of clown doll, and um, the the group of children that haven't seen that video don't go in and whack the clown. They look at all the different sort of uh, toys and play with them. The ones who've, who've seen the video are much more likely to go in and pick up a mallet and whack the doll. And, and it's actually very distressing. You can see on, on, on YouTube, you, you see, you know, lovely little girls just hitting this thing because they've see, seen it done. Children... Children learn by mimicry, um, and if you hit children, you are teaching them to expect either to dominate or to be <coughs> dominated through physical violence, and I don't want our children to be taught that. Um, and also, as a since my particular specialty, developmental paediatrics and disability, uh, I would point out... Um, when uh, people realised that adults with learning uh, disabilities were being hit at, at Winterbourne, Winterbourne View, there was universal public outcry. If those 
people with learning difficulties had been 15, would it have been okay to hit them? If they were 12, would it have been okay to hit them? If they were nine, if they were five, if they, th they were three, would that have been okay to hit them? What age do you think I can tell that a child has a learning disability or has autism or has whatever problem? Not usually when they're three, and yet the peak age for, for hit hitting, when you look at uh, cohort studies uh, uh, growing up in Scotland, the Millennium Cohort Study, is three. So you... Like, is it a tap, is it a thump, is it a hit, is it a whack, is it a smack? Also, what is the developmental potential of that, 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 that person that you're hitting? It's, it, you know, it's it's inappropriate way of, of, of trying to manage a uh, child's behaviour. It doesn't work to improve their behaviour. It can uh, lead to uh, long-standing difficulties with uh, aggressive behaviours, antisocial behaviours, or with problems with self-esteem self and uh, depression. Uh, there are no good arguments for doing it. It's like arguing to say, as I say, that my child shouldn't wear a seatbelt. Um, there's every reason to protect them. I think at this point, Mary Fee had some questions on... Um, Harm of I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for um, the, the information that you've given us, um, Dr Reynolds, because I did. My, my next question was to ask about the, the impact of, of hitting um, a, a child has. Now, whether that's long term, short term, the difference in their behaviour, and you have spoken to some degree about that. Um, and I wonder if there's anything else you wanted to comment about the long term physical and mental impact on, on hitting a child, and if the rest of the panel would like to um, comment. Well, again, you know, it's important to, to, to realise that this isn't the, 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 all the studies, like if you, that, that systematic review, um, those studies were not about um, hitting at the level where it's causing obvious injury. Mm -hmm. This is the day-to-day -day hitting, what you might say smacking or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, it, it, you've probably heard all that. I know you've heard from academics already, so I, I, I'm a bit hesitant about going to research uh, evidence. But just the Growing Up in Scotland study, when they asked two-year-olds, uh, sorry, not asked two-year-olds, asked the parents or main caregiver of a two-year-old, um, and they'd excluded uh, two-year-olds who already had any kind of behavioural difficulties, whether or not they they sometimes uh, smacked, hit their children. And then they looked at, um, uh, at the age of four, once that cohort had been followed through, and um, they compared the uh, four-year-olds whose parent or caregiver had said at two that, yes, they sometimes smacked, and the ones who said they didn't. And the, the ones who had sometimes been smacked at four were more than twice as likely to have some sort of behavioural difficulties on the... Um, uh, uh, strengths and difficulties questionnaire um, and also studies where you're looking at children who already have behavioural problems and um, the uh, interventions that are more likely to be successful in reducing the aggressive uh, uh, behaviours are, are the ones where you had a, a lower level of, of physical punishment at baseline and that the intervention reduced that level of physical punishment. It's very difficult, you know, it would be very expensive to do things where you follow people on till the mm. age of 25, 30, 40 or, or whatever. So going to anecdote, I mean, I, I, you know, I know for myself that uh, um, all I remember from being smacked, I don't remember individual instances, they were very rare, but I do remember a really deep sense of injustice when it's happened. That's the thing that I remember. And speaking to friends who were... Sorry, am right, I sorry. going off topic? No, no, not at all. I just, I wonder if I'll bring in some of the other panel members um, t to to give some uh, yeah. reflections. As sorry, well. yeah, the other, the, so the one, okay, going back to practice. Parents, I hear parents say to me things like, um, uh, my mother said, uh, you know, if a child is bitten, uh, bite him back so he knows what it feels like. And that's such a deep misunderstanding of what a child would learn through doing that. Um, yes, yeah, so that's Thank the kind of thing I hear day to day. Do, do any other uh, of the panel members have any any different? Um, <coughs> to add that, you know, I work in an environment where we are quite rightly not allowed to hit children. But if you go back, you know, in Scottish education, and, and certainly when I was at secondary school, on the belt existed corporal punishment, and I think there was a fear in schools at that time. I think it led to quite a lot of disengagement in the part of some young people too. And we know so much more about the best ways for, for children and young people to learn now. And again, it goes back to we know at the heart of good learning, good relationships, kindness, caring, etc. And I don't think you're going to have that if you in any way promote um, an education system where 
um, you would allow violence. Uh, and the point of um, uh, the last question as well about restraint and violence, etc. Well, I was in a home economics classroom yesterday with 20 teenagers making a cake and there's cookers on and there's knives, etc. But we taught them, we teach them how to be in a safe environment. And for those children who and young people who do find it difficult to self-regulate, again, we talk to them very much about the implications of, of any kind of poor behaviour in that environment and the importance of health and safety. So I think it goes back to that mantra of if you build good relationships and if you teach young people and children what's right and wrong and how to behave, then you, you move away from that environment of it being anything at all to do with violence. Okay. Okay. At, at this station, does anyone have anything else to add? Or? Okay. Um, we've got till about five past ten, so we'll try and keep... Um, no. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a very important, interesting topic, but I think we'll, we'll get for I know. Um, Annie Wells. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, as we've heard, there's a lot of Public, in, public interest in this legislation that's, that we're discussing today. And there's quite a lot of individuals who have raised concerns about the, what we're discussing. Do you think the bill will criminalise parents and lead to an increase in prosecutions? And are you aware of any evidence of this? Just open to, to all, all panel members. Uh, no, my experience in dealing with child protection in Edinburgh, as I was saying earlier on, where harm has occurred, we're trying to get alongside families and not criminalise them and not over-proceduralise things. And it is very rare for a case in which a parent has assaulted the child to proceed to a prosecution, in my experience, unless there has been some evidence of real intent to harm and something we're very worried about. Most parents who hit children, and you know, there's been a loss of control, there's a poor relationship, there's stress around, and we need to help them with these things and not criminalise them. I'm very clear about that. Maybe I can speak from the Irish experience. Uh, certainly, uh, I, the, the reason I chose the legislation I chose uh, was because there was no sanctions in it. Because for me, as parents have the toughest job in the world, they also have the most rewarding job in the world. Uh, and we need to ensure that as a society, we work to help parents. Uh, and, and going back to the previous question, we know from research that hitting children either has no effect or it has a negative effect. And therefore, I felt as a legislator, we have a responsibility to support parents in their important role and ensure that we have laws uh, that will reflect uh, what, what works. In relation to criminalising, um, in advance of this meeting, I once again contacted uh, our child and family agency. So they, that, that, that's our body for social workers uh, and engagements with parents uh, and families in Ireland. They have, uh, they're an agency that are relatively new, part of our historic past. So they started on the 1st of January 2014. Uh, they have not. They've seen a slight increase, but they don't believe it's the change in law. It's more about the new agency that is dedicated towards supporting children and family. Uh, our Office of the Director uh, uh, for Public Prosecutions don't keep statistics of this nature, but they have checked and they have no evidence of any increase uh, in prosecutions. And with our Garda Shikona, who's our police service, uh, they equally have no evidence of any increase in criminalising of parents. But each one of them, when I contacted, used the word clarity, that the law brought clarity uh, and helped them in their work. Thank you. Um, just on to my next question. Sorry. Yeah. But I'll make it, I'll try and be, be brief. To, to, to us in, as paediatricians, um, this would not change the threshold at which child protection procedures are, are implemented. We, this is very much a public health measure. Sometimes uh, changing the law is the most effective way of affecting public health change. And I would always give the, uh, the analogy of with the smoking ban. Um, that So for myself, someone who goes to lots of gigs, you know, music, and you're in the middle of a crowd... Um, it was horrible before the ban, you know, always going home with smoky hair and clothes. But after the ban, sometimes somebody would light up in the middle of a crowd. I didn't dial 999 or try and get out of the crowd and call a policeman. I just said, sorry, could you stop doing that? And I know that the force of, of public opinion around me will be with me. And they stop. You know, I, I've never had a problem with asking someone to stop smoking since the ban. Thank you for that. Um... There is also concern that this bill will interfere in private family life. Is this concern justified? Well, I mean, <laughs> you could equally say... Um, uh, um, well, I've already said, is things like saying that uh, you should 
uh, put a seatbelt on when you put your child in the car? Is that, you know, is that interfering with family life? I would also say, um, in the past, people might have been able to smack their servants or their wife or their whatever. Why, why is it okay, you know, to interfere in family life to protect protect women, protect adults? Why is it not okay to protect children? Yeah, so agreed. You know, children just need equal protection to adults, and we do not intervene disproportionately. We try to make best use of resources by doing what is needed and no more than that as early a stage as possible. So no agency is in the business of wanting to interfere. As I was saying earlier on, we're too busy doing other things that do need, need us to intervene, and uh, I'm not worried about that. I think this is a simple case of children having equal rights, and that is not an interference in family life. It's ensuring that everybody has that same protection. And in education, we obviously promote um, UNICEF. I've got a badge on today, wearing it with pride. Um, rights respecting schools and the rights of uh, children and young people's voices to be heard. And I think that you can't say that that stops at a school gate. It has to be beyond that school gate, and it has to be about all environments that children should feel safe. Time. It's not about interfering in family life. It's ensuring, though, that children can live in a world free from violence, and that includes their own home. Their home should be the safest place. And any exposure to violence, whether it's domestic violence or hitting of a child, is telling children that there is some level of violence that is acceptable. Um, and just as a corollary to the previous question, there was one case we had uh, since the law change where a member of the public witnessed a child being hit in a car park, quite severely hit, uh, and reported it. Uh, and it turned out that that child was being significantly abused. So, and the member of the public cited the change in law, gave them the courage to say, this is not OK, this is not. So we have seen that one prosecution. Uh, so I just want to make sure that I, I answer your, your question with integrity. But for me, it's more about us as a society ensuring. So if I see a parent having a difficult moment with their child in a supermarket because of where they're displaying the sweets, uh, I don't immediately jump in to criticise the parent. I'm actually seeing how can I help to calm this situation. So I will usually be heard muttering, it's disgraceful the way they have sweets uh, out there at an eye level for a child. So I think for me, changing the law in Ireland was about us as a society taking a responsibility that we support parents in their role. We know that hitting doesn't work. So let's talk about what actually works. Let's support them in that important role that they have. Can I just ask course, one yeah. small one? Would it be different if there was sanctions? Would, well, would, it, be, would it be different? And, and I don't think, for me, that there is laws about assault, there is laws on child abuse. So those laws have been tried and tested and they are there. This is quite archaic, in my opinion, that we have a threshold that we say in relation to a child, we have this threshold that you have to pass before those laws can apply. Uh, so for me, it's, it's very clearly about removing that defence uh, that came from our, our shared common law. So it's about removing that defence. It's not about putting any additional burdens, because those laws, those laws exist. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Um, Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I was going to ask a question. We've we've had a concern raised that um, if if there was um, any increase in prosecutions, there would be an increase on public services. But you've said that there wasn't. There was just that one case um, in Ireland. So just to get on the record, do you think there will be any increase uh, in a burden on public services should this law pass? I think in terms of the cause of view, we think there's probably just still a bit more work to be done in terms of getting an understanding definitely from what the impact of local government on this is, is going to be. We think currently the financial memorandum sort of thinks that it can all be met within current costs. I just think there's a bit more consideration to be done with both local government and sort of Scottish government working together to find out really bottom out what some of those are. But I don't think it's going to be sort of prohibitively high, but we just need to have a bit more of a, a deeper understanding of what that's going to look like. OK, um, I, I am going to come on to questions about um, the financial memorandum. The um, bill's proposer, um, John Finney, has calculated that it's going to cost around 300,000, but the Scottish Government have countered that with a figure of 20,000. So there's quite a big disparity there. Um, so I, I suppose, um, Matthew Sweeney, from your point of view, what 
extra scrutiny do you think needs to be done to satisfy local authorities that we are providing the, the funds that's gonna need, that we're going to need to see this through? I think it's just sort of reflecting what are the likely additional costs. Obviously, there may be some additional ones on children and family social work, and maybe Andy can come in with some of the more detail of what that's going to look like in practice. But some of the other things that sort of may want to be considered further is about um, what would sort of promotion look like, and do we want to have some of that done at a local level? Because perhaps their local authorities have effective ins with their communities, and if we want to really promote this change at that local level, perhaps additional resources to councils would help with that. Uh, and the further one we want to maybe sort of just put out for consideration is what type of support would we like for families sort of as alternative sort of support strategies for parenting? And then again, how can we support local authorities to financially enable them to do that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, if you just to press you a little bit on that, we heard from Andy Jeffries there that actually there wouldn't be a substantial change because social workers would still be working alongside um, families. And I suppose what, what this intends to do is to provide clarity. Can I just press you a little further on what additional costs you think there will be to, to children and family, family services in local authorities? So that was based on the sort of international evidence, which has broadly seen that there has been a slight increase in reporting, but not prosecution. Okay. So that was that. And I don't Thank know you. if anyone wants to come in and sort of... Thanks, Gil Ross. OK, thanks. Um, Sorry, Lucy, did yeah, from a paediatrician's point of view, uh, we would feel it was very important to have some initial invest investment in an information, you know, public message campaign. Yeah. Um, we would think the timing is very good in that there has been um, recent investment in health visiting services. It's so, so, you know, for people to be there to support uh, families who are asking about, uh, uh, about it and about appropriate methods for, for um, uh, supporting a child. Um, and their behaviours. But uh, in the longer term, for specialist services, you'll know that the College of Psychiatrists, Royal College of Psychiatrists of Scotland, were entirely supportive of the bill and on consultation, because obviously they're the people that when children have significant emotional behavioural difficulties, um, would be seeing them in the longer term. So in the longer term, we would expect s some savings. Okay. Maybe I could just... Sorry, sorry. No, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so I made that point earlier on about uh, much of this being core business. I mean, I should point out, you know, first of all, the distinction between the two roles that I have. On one hand, I'm representing Social Work Scotland here, but I also have talked about my work in the City of Edinburgh, and I will not be popular with anybody in either place if I don't make that distinction. The Social Work Scotland position is similar to COSLA in that we are saying just a bit more detailed financial impact assessment would, would be in order. That is not necessarily just in relation to more social workers knocking on doors, but you know, getting this right needs a number of things in, to be in place, a comms campaign, parenting support. There might be needing to be some consideration of communities that would be harder to reach. So there are some parts of the community in which this message is going to be, be more difficult than others. We might want to engage with community groups and faith groups. That's the kind of work I think needs to happen to help this to be effective right across the country. So it's not just me saying I need another social worker for these six extra cases. It's actually broader work than that. And I think that's where we're seeing the financial impact needs to be assessed in a wee bit more detail. It's just a note of caution, given diminishing resources across the board, you know. Presumably, that though, that, um, you're already working with these communities, and um, yes. so, it's, so it's not brand new work, it's no. additional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Gillian. Sorry, just, just to add from my, my side is uh, in relation to our agencies in Ireland, uh, when the change in law happened, uh, th they saw that social workers, for example, were seeking more information and guidance internally within the agency. Uh, as I have said previously, we have a different process in Ireland uh, and our budget uh, allocated was zero. So we didn't have any information raising or campaigning uh, in relation. I would love there to be a massive campaign uh, to ensure uh, that we, we, we give a message to all children and to all parents. Uh, but that should not stop us, I felt, uh, me as a legislator, to change the law. So in Ireland, if you didn't have a, a public awareness raising campaign, how did you convey to people that the law had changed? We conveyed it through the organisations that engage and interact with children, so whether it's from public health nurses, paediatricians, social workers, so those people who are engaging on a daily basis, early learning centres, schools, uh, through the media. Uh, so 
it was for me it was fascinating to see about how that cultural change happened so quickly that people automatically assumed it and in fact only this morning when I was discussing with a member of the public that I was here they said but that law changed two years ago in Scotland so it is interesting that when you start having these debates public automatically start in their mind saying oh well that's that's changed is there anything that you would have done differently looking back now um, would I have done differently? I suppose if I had realised that there were so many countries in the world that hadn't changed their laws, I might feel a little bit more uh, uh, anxious about changing the law. But to be honest, no, because for me it was, even if I was going to be the only member of parliament uh, that advocated this change in law, I wanted children to know uh, that I stood for them uh, and that I believed that they could be in a home free from violence. So. For me, I would still have done exactly the same. Uh, what was really heartening was that so many of my colleagues right across parties all realised that the time was right uh, for us to change the law. Okay. Um, I want to um, just pick up on something that Matthew Sweeney said in response to the question that the convener asked. Um, you, you stated that there had been an increase in reporting, but not in prosecutions. Is, was that from... Ireland, or was that an example from elsewhere? Yes, yeah, so when um, the uh, cause of children young people were considered this, we heard uh, sort of research was presented by Directors of Public Health and by Social Work Scotland, and I think that was from uh, international evidence, both from uh, across Europe and across the world more broadly. So I, that's where it came from. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to get that on yeah. the record. Um, and, and just one final thing. Um, we've also had representations to us that said, well, if we're going to, I mean, public awareness raising an education campaign is possibly something that we should be doing anyway to try and um, uh, not teach, but advise parents of alternative positive parenting techniques instead of using smacking, which sometimes is used um, as a last resort. Do you feel that an awareness raising and education campaign would be enough on its own, and why do we need the legislation to back it up? How, how can you give an awareness raising campaign that is saying something that's the opposite from what the law says? Yeah. You know, you, 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 the law is, is an absolute barrier to us doing what we know we have to do. Yeah, it, it sends a muddled message, and that goes back to what social workers have said to me and public health nurses, is that before the change in law in Ireland, they were saying, well, it's not really good, you shouldn't, and all the research and the evidence, and here's what you should do. So they're having that discussion, rather than being really clear and saying, you're not allowed to hit, in the same way I'm not allowed to hit Lucy, you're not allowed to hit children, and now here's what you can do. Yes, Andy. Yeah, agreed. I just think absolute clarity in legislation is helpful, and I think this is heading things in the right direction. And there's an intersection with other proposals, such as the revision of Section 12 of the 1937 Children and Young People's Act on willful ill treatment and neglect. There are some grey areas in the legislation that aren't that helpful when we're trying to get it right with parents and change behaviour, and I think clarity will just help that. I mean, sometimes we can have quite difficult conversation with parents and carers, you know, particularly when some young people have difficulties self-regulating their behaviours. And in those discussions, often the comments are made, well, I know you can't do that here, but we do that. And sometimes I think some parents can find it difficult to see that that relationship that, that they are developing is actually not helping the situation when they actually come into school and then in their life. And I think that clarity would help us quite significantly in those discussions too. Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Good morning, uh, good morning panel. Uh, most of the areas that I was going to um, ask about have been covered, so I've got three quite, uh, actually quite specific um, questions for the panel. And I'll just say what a fantastic uh, panel session uh, this has been this morning. Um, the, uh, Andy, Jeffries, you've, um, you've mentioned quite helpfully the, the child protection processes, and it's something that, <clears throat> that I have and, and other members and uh, panellists have brought up at the, uh, the, the previous sessions as well. And I think you've covered the main points I would uh, already that, that I would have wanted to get out. But I wonder if there's, if this law was to be passed, would you be able to explain to the committee how the current jail protection processes, uh, you know, a, a, a hypothetical situation coming in to you would change? 
Uh, they wouldn't change at all. It's the same business. So, so national guidance says that if you have a child protection concern, you take a multi-agency approach to that. And that means that three main agencies come together for a conversation, which is social work, police and the NHS. So what you're trying to do in that conversation is establish an agreed multi-agency assessment of risk, establish the immediate arrangement for the safety of that child, and then get a plan for moving forward. And that will just be the same with any of these kind of concerns. There is a, there is a principle of minimal intervention. The national guidance is in the process of being uh, revised this year as well. You might know, I mean, that whole multi-agency process, my own view is that that could be made even clearer in national guidance, so we'll be looking at that anyway. But essentially, it's about a conversation that has the child at the heart and thinks about immediate safety and how then are we going to help together, and that will be exactly the same before and after this piece of legislation. So to put on the record for, for, for people who might be watching this and that they, they, they might be worried about it, you wouldn't envisage there being a dramatic increase in children and put through child protection procedures or placed on the child protection register as a result of this legislation? It's very hard to give a definitive answer to that. I mean, child protection concerns vary a lot. As I was saying earlier on, I sign off all the child protection concerns in Edinburgh on a, on a, at a weekly meeting that is multi-agency. The highest number of cases we've looked at in this calendar year is 66, and the lowest number is 22. So that varies a lot over time, and you just respond to the things that need to be responded to. But I would say, and, and to echo a point I made earlier on, that if we get the GERFEC approach right, there will be less children coming through a child protection route. And in Edinburgh, we have got less children on the child protection register than we've ever had. And we've got the lowest number of looked after children that we've had in 10 years. So there's something about getting GERFEC right with those families that is working. But the main thing in relation to child protection is that three agencies are agreed and satisfied that that child is safe and we're doing the right things together. Uh, and, oh, sorry. Also, from, from, the from the evidence, one might actually expect a reduction in some, some child protection cases because, as Gillian has said, if hitting a child is part of your repertoire of, of ordinary discipline, then at a time of stress, you may do it harder than you really intended to and, and injure a child to the point where child protection measures may kick in. But if it just isn't part of your repertoire, you don't have, you know, even when you're stressed, it, it's not the first thing that you think of doing. So, um, yeah, some of the papers in that systematic review suggested that, that, that there's, there would be a reduction in, um, in cases of hitting hard because people aren't hitting at all. Thanks very much for that. And I, I suppose the other side of that is, so the, the child protection is one side that, <clears throat> that, that people maybe have worries about. The other side is the criminalisation, which has been well covered already in, in the panel. But uh, yourself, Andy Jeffries, and anybody else um, on the panel, are you aware of the, the, the reasonable, uh, the defence of reasonable chastisement being used? Um, I don't tend to deal with cases by the time they're out of the child protection process, so I'm no expert on outcomes in court and what happens in court. Uh, I mean, it's, that's, that happens after the child protection process has done its job. What, what about in Ireland, Gillian Vinton? How did you, did you come across that when you were taking this uh, law through? We, we have seen, we, we, I, I did talk to people about private in-camera court hearings, uh, uh, what was happening. We, we rarely saw the defence being used, but we, it has had been used in, in a few cases, a number of cases. So, uh, But I haven't seen any increase. Nobody has noticed any increases or any, any trends significant other than, uh, as Andy has clearly said, you know, there's always parameters uh, in relation to child protection that you, you have, but uh, we haven't seen any differential. So we, we wouldn't really see the relevance of that, whether, yeah. whether there had been cases prosecuted, you know, or sorry, sorry, where people had used successfully used the defence in the past. It's the public health message that having a law saying that it's OK gives. It's not, it's not whether it's been used before or not. We need to get rid of it. So we get rid of that societal message saying it is justifiable and reasonable for parents or care caregivers to hit 
children. So, so is it fair to say that the, it's the, the, the clarity that it sounds like yes. rather than the... Yes, clarity, the, clarity, clarity. I, I was yeah. supposed to say the word clarity. Gillian said it already. We're all... Clarity is the big but message here. It's the word you hear back from everybody without me, yeah. without me putting it into their mouths as such. When, when I contacted the different agencies, the different organisations, the word clarity just keeps coming up. One more question, Kevin, if that's all right. Um, we heard last week when we were in Skying Committee um, an aspect that I personally, I, I support this bill uh, for the record, but uh, an aspect that I hadn't actually heard before we heard that if this law is passed, that it might impact on the more vulnerable um, and disadvantaged communities uh, where there's maybe already services involved, police officers, social workers and such like. Um, I don't personally think that would be the case, but I, w I wanted to put it to the panel, particularly Andy Jeffries again, sorry, I'm not picking on you such bit, but the other panel as well, other panel members too, if you think there is any, um, there is any relevance in that argument. Yeah, I think there will be sections of the community in which this message is harder to, to get heard than others. You know, faith groups would be another, you're talking about different value bases, different beliefs. So there may be disproportionate impact on some communities. And as I was saying earlier on, they're the areas in which we need to work to do the education and engage people and get them on board. But, you know, nobody is going to want to punish people who already have adverse life experiences because of poverty or domestic abuse or whatever else they're having to live with us. None of us would want these things present in our lives. And I keep coming back to this point, but it's about how we get alongside those people and help them not to hit their children. Children. It's just as simple as that. We must help them to do other things that are not hitting children. Yeah, for, for us, certainly in Ireland, uh, and I, I don't know the situation in Scotland, but there is a, a, a disproportionate belief, I believe, that you know child abuse is more likely to happen in, in, in poverty than it is likely to happen in a family who have respectable professions. And we, we as a society and as legislators have to continually challenge that belief. Uh, and I think that is important. In the change in law, we did also see that there was a challenge with some of our minority groups uh, about explaining and, and sharing that change in law. But when I engaged with the, those leaders, those respected individuals in the minority groups, they took it as a really welcome challenge uh, to, in, to, to talk uh, with their, uh, their groupings, with, with their members, uh, to, to share with them the positive parenting and how, how you raise children in Ireland. So I, for me, it's clarity again. If there is a, a different difference in the prevalence of, of, of children being hit uh, across the socioeconomic uh, spectrum, well, all the more reason for, for, for them to get the more benefit, you know, if, 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 it, if it's in more deprived communities. I mean, I've worked for the past 17 years as a consultant in North Glasgow. I also cover part of East Dunbartonshire, so occasionally I'll see someone who's a bit more affluent. Um, but uh, that conversation that I had, uh, that I mentioned, where a, a, a young mum, that was certainly from a, a, a deprived background, said, Saying that when her son uh, bit another child, her mother said, um, uh, "Bite him back, so he under you know, so he knows what it feels like." Once I'd explained to her, she could understand. Oh yeah, of course, it's ridiculous. I'll now tell my mother, you know. Um, but even last week. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think exactly. I'm picturing these parents and thinking, hmm, where, where did they live? How affluent were they? But certainly educated, pe pe both parents. The fact that it wasn't a single parent, both parents in front of me were talking about their child's behavioural difficulties, wondering whether the child might have difficulties on the autism spectrum. And the dad just made a comment about saying, oh, yeah, well, he doesn't even seem to understand when I give him a smack, blah, blah, blah. And then, and, uh, so he, he clearly didn't think that a paediatrician would have any issue with that. Um, so he just didn't... And, and, of course, I'm not down his throat saying, oh, you terrible, terrible person, but he just didn't know and, and it was funny because because his partner is immediately oh you know don't mention the the, the, the smacking so yeah the the, the confusion uh there but uh I, yeah i hear it from from families in all different circumstances right um we have a another question from alex Cole hamilton and then um gordon lindhurst and i'm conscious we're drawing into the last Eight minutes. So, thank you very much for bringing me back in, convener. Uh, two, it's actually two very quick questions. One directly again to Gillian Van Turnhout. We've heard a lot about clarity. Um, I think there is a perception, as uh, Andy Jeffries raised, that, that we've already done this and that smacking is already illegal in this country among many, many parents. Um, but can I ask? Um, so there is a confusion there. Since the law came was changed in Ireland, has that clarity been um, established? 
I believe it has, and I've, I don't have any evidence because we haven't done any polling. Uh, I did try to see if I had any statistical evidence to present to you, uh, but what I have done is done very wide consultations uh, in advance of coming here today. Uh, and I also, as a volunteer, I'm a, a member of the Irish Girl Guides and I'm a safeguarding trainer. And one of the things we do in trainings is these scenarios and saying, you know, from one to ten on abuse and hitting of children. And I know uh, since we've changed the law and we're doing the trainings, Everyone at those trainings knows it before I have said anything or any of the other trainers. I, I, I'm in charge of all of our trainers as a volunteer. And all of them said uh, that, and that's right around geographically from Ireland, that as mothers, certainly, they know about the change in law. Thank you. And my second question is again about the evidence we'll hear this afternoon from the American ap academic Professor Lazellery. Um, he suggests that uh, without having uh, a recourse to mild backup smacking, as he uh, describes it, um, then parents may become increasingly frustrated until they are likely to explode with severe verbal or physical violence. Um, is there any empirical evidence of that either in Ireland or elsewhere in the international community where this has already happened? And is it a concern of any of the panellists? I, I, I suppose I, I just find it uh, very difficult to even uh, understand the rationale for that argument. Certainly in advance of changing the law in Ireland, I, I read quite considerable amount of research. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity of the Anya uh, Hyman research on equal protection uh, that wasn't available at that time. Uh, but I did look at the research done by Elizabeth Gershoff, which she did, it looked at 75 studies, 161,000 children, uh, over 50 years of research. Uh, so she took all of that herself and, and Grogan Taylor. Uh, and that very clearly found uh, that there was no evidence uh, that, that uh, spanking is associated with any improved child behaviour. And in fact, it was more likely uh, to be associated with trouble, troubling outcomes, any level uh, of, of hitting of a child. Can I say, you know, systematic reviews are, you know, the word systematic is there. There are people going, looking across... Um, you know, doing searches on keywords, finding good quality studies that that give evidence for what you you know you, uh, what you're studying. Um, that you know that that hasn't been quoted any of those systematic reviews. That that I mean, it just sounds like somebody who has a preconceived position and is tr picking cherry picking, clutching at straws to find something that might support what they're they're saying. You know, obviously I represent an organisation which represents adults, the length and breadth of Scotland, who work with children and young people every day, and sometimes in difficult and distressing situations. And there has never, ever been um, anyone who would come forward and say the answer to this is to use violence towards any of those children and young people. And in fact, the message from us is very clear. It is promoting good health and well-being amongst our children and young people and teaching them about the ways in which they can improve that health and well-being and their social and emotional development. Those are what will ensure that in Scotland we have children and young people who will go on to become parents and carers who would not consider using violence towards any other young person. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, I'm bringing um, Gordon Linter to MSP. Um, thank you, convener. Um, a question for Gillian, perhaps. Um, I read your submission to the committee, which was very helpful, very, very interesting, about the, the Irish change in law. Um, what I want to ask, you refer on that to the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act in 1897, which is your codified criminal law, and of course we don't have codified criminal law in Scotland. Um, there are certain defences in that, for example in Section 2 that defines assault, um, part of which subsection 3 relates to a defendant not knowing or believing that what they do, the force or impact, as you define it in your law, assault, uh, if they don't know or believe it is unacceptable to the other person. Now, um, do you think um, our, our procedure at stage two, individual MSPs can bring forward amendments? So I'm just wondering, uh, thinking about that, do you think that Scottish parents and uh, families should have the same protections in law that Irish parents and families do that uh, we don't have in our, our common law as opposed to your criminal codified system? Firstly, we don't have a codified law, so just to be absolutely mm -hmm. clear, we don't uh, use that system. We also have a common law, and mm -hmm. with a common law tradition like yourselves, over the years it has evolved and we have made changes in, in our legislation. Uh, in relation to choosing the Non-Fatal Offences Against the uh, Person Act of 1997, uh, 
to amend is that is because that is where assault and physical assault was situated mm. uh, and this, the government felt that that was the best place. I was very privileged to have the authority of our Attorney General in helping us in, in, in making that amendment. I, I originally submitted my own amendment, my own humble amendment, but I had the authority of the uh, government and the Attorney General. Uh, we changed the law within our Children First Act, so the amendment actually was to repeal the common law defence of reasonable chastisement uh, and then you place it in the best piece of legislation. So it was in relation to our Children First Act, which was a, a safeguarding child protection act. It's about having safeguarding statements in youth halls and around the country. So it, it, those pieces of legislation was part of that act. There was no sanctions within that act, which is why I chose that piece of legislation. Also, I should add, when we changed the law in Ireland, uh, as we did in this case, uh, very often uh, for somebody like myself as a children's rights advocate also, is that it takes quite some time for the government to commence that piece of legislation. So, but unusually, and I think this pays testament uh, to the public opinion questions, the resources question, within four weeks, the government commenced that piece of legislation. It was very expeditiously changed uh, because it was a repeal of that common law defence uh, within uh, or common law tradition that we have in Ireland. Of course, yeah. um, I mean, that's, that's a very helpful clarification. So, um, as you say, you don't have a codified criminal no. law, but assault is defined in a statute, so an act of parliament. Um, so, it's almost like you have a, a mixed system between a, a, a codified system, a common law system. I mean, similar perhaps to England, where they have a lot of offences defined in statute, some are common law. Um, I think what we're dealing with here is repeal of a defence to uh, a common law defined form of assault. So it's, it's not quite your system. Mm -hmm. um, but I think your key point is that there's no sanction in terms of criminal law sanctions. Did I understand you correctly no, on that? The, the laws apply in relation to assault, in relation to child abuse. So all yes. of those laws mm -hmm. apply. But what we did, and the change that I brought forward, uh, and, and certainly from my reading is what I read within your legislation, but I am not in any way yes. saying I understand the Scottish system. But because we come from a common law tradition, as over 70 countries in the world, uh, we have the same root. So the same rooting that Scotland has for its common law in relation to reasonable chastisement is our, our, our root that we had in Ireland. What we did in our legislation was to repeal the defence uh, under common law, which is how all countries, to my understanding, change common law over time through our, our legislation we are able to amend and change and update our laws and thinking. So that's what we did in Ireland. Okay. Well, can I um, thank the panel, panel members for their evidence this morning? That's been really helpful for us. And we'll suspend until 10.15 till any witnesses to change over. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, I should say, and um, welcome back. Um, we now welcome panel two in our evidence session. John McKenzie, Chief Superintendent, Head of Safer Communities Police Scotland. Mary McMillan, Criminal Law Committee, Law Society of Scotland. And Neil Hunter, Principal Reporter, Scottish Children's Reporter Administration. You're all very welcome. Can I start things off by asking you if you support the aims of the bill to end the physical punishment of children and to give your reflections on why public opinion is, is so mixed on this matter. Neil. Yeah, the uh, Children's Reporters Administration very much uh, supports um, the aims of this bill, and for a number of reasons. I think uh, one we've heard already this morning, um, the bill clarifies a currently very ambiguous uh, aspect of law in relation to uh, defence of justifiable uh, chastisement. Um, I think a lot of the discussion this morning already has focused on the need for absolute clarity for, for parents and society about what is um, acceptable and what is not acceptable in relation to children. The second uh, reason why we support the Bill's uh, intent is because I think um, it very importantly identifies children as independent holders of rights uh, and not rights that are mediated through, uh, through adults or, or, or through their parents, but um, who have rights uh, as uh, equal uh, but slightly different to, to adults uh, and are independent uh, holders of those rights. Um, I think it helps also bring Scotland into line with UNCRC, as we've heard, I think, in a number of sessions, uh, and promotes positive approaches to parenting and, and starts to help us negate the impact of uh, more, less appropriate uh, uh, aspects of, of parenting behaviour. Um, in relation to public opinion, I think, you know, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, I suppose in many ways it depends what question you ask the public um, and public opinion. Um, if you ask it in relation to focusing, uh, framing that around um, the potential aspects of criminalisation that we've heard um, throughout the, the passage of the bill today, then you'll get one response. If you frame it in a much more positive way around uh, children's rights and um, protecting children from, from harms and um, promoting um, the long term long-term well-being of children, you'll get a very different response. Okay, thank you. Um, John McKenzie. Um, the aim of the bill that's outlined uh, on the proposal document is sort of split into two bits. The first bit, in terms of to promote and safeguard the health and well-being of children and young people, ensuring they're afforded the same rights to protection from assaults as adults. That falls in line with Police Scotland's values, and we support that component. The vehicle in which it's highlighted within the bill in terms of um, removing the defence linked to justifiable assault. Well, you'll be aware that Police Scotland usually remain neutral in terms of our position in terms of legislation. Um, and actually, I will answer that component in this manner. It's ultimately for the legislator to make a policy decision on what they believe based on evidence. But let me tell you what I think the evidence is based on my judgment and Police Scotland's judgment. It's clear that um, the multi-agency response that's talked about greatly within the evidence providing sessions would not change from a police and social work perspective. The, the issue of the evidence that exists seems to support that actually the well-being of children are served by the legislation that's placed in front based on the body of evidence that's been provided. Um, it's clear that there's lessons that can be learned from other areas which hold in principle a common law system such as New Zealand and the Republic of Ireland, um, such as explanation notes for parents around that aspect of restraint that's already been spoken about in the earlier session, and also the communication component within the Republic of Ireland, so there's components of that. So going back to the point of do Police Scotland support it, we support the principle that's highlighted. I believe there's a body of evidence to support the rationale behind it, but ultimately the decision for the removal of that uh, defence is for the, a policy decision for the legislator. In terms of the uh, public awareness, I was just saying to Neil before we came on, I was trying, in my notes I have actually got from the public survey, 75% of respondents actually supported the bill, 25 did not, but I just cannot find where that source component is, but it's in my notes, so I believe that to be correct. Okay. So actually, my anticipation is that the issue of public uh, support um, will enhance as we move forward. It's demonstrated in Sweden that that's a position. It's been demonstrated in the Republic of Ireland that's a position. So actually, I am not so convinced that there is such a polar 
position within the public of Scotland. And this goes back to the proud history that Scotland has from the 60s with Club Brandon and our approach to criminalisation of children and our approach to Gurfecht. So actually, the stance I have and the judgment I have is there are not such polar opinions across the mass of the population within Scotland. Thank you. Mary McMillan. Hi. Um, as, as you've said, I'm representing the Law Society's Criminal Law Committee, and it's not our role to comment on social policy, much similar to my colleague. Um, however, clarity of the law is something that is really important to the Law Society. Um, and in terms of, I, I work as a defence um, agent at the moment, um, and the law is not clear at the moment. It's not easily understood by people. Um, effectively, I, I think we sometimes talk about this incorrectly, and as though it is um, already, how to explain it properly, um, it's already an offence to assault a child, if that's what you're talking about. Actually, what there is is there's defences in law, and I know you've heard lots of evidence around that, but that, that has to be the starting point, and explaining the nuance of those defences and what that means is not something that's well understood by the public or by clients, um, and I think any clarification of the law is always helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Oliver Mundell. Thank you uh, very much, uh, convener, and I, I'm very interested in the, the point that uh, you, you've just made, uh, Mary McCallum, because uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that worries me uh, with, with, with how the bills, uh, the particular method uh, that we've, we've chosen for, 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 for changing this defence out of, out of law, uh, because I think we hear lots of people talking about this being an anti-smacking bill, um, and you know, Clearly, on the face of it, that that's not what it is. Um, and we just heard in the previous session, uh, one of the witnesses say, "We don't know the difference between a smack and a whack, um, and that there's no invisible line." Uh, but I wondered, in in legal terms, in and in your practical experience, do the courts make a distinction uh, when it comes to assault between maybe a smack or a whack uh, and something that's designed or intended? Uh, to cause cause physical harm. Well, if you were to speak about, if you take children and, and, and actually what we're talking about today almost out of the equation and just look at assault and how assault is dealt with in the, the court system, that's relatively clear and the court's, I think, well used to dealing with that and knowing how to. Um, it, it does have to have that intention to harm um, and, and there's various uh, ways in which that's looked at. But I think... Um, <coughs> I suppose effectively there will still be a small grey line, a grey area, but ultimately that will end up being down to um, a prosecutor prosecutorial decision as to whether or not it's in the public interest to prosecute. Um, and some of what you're talking about, it may be deemed that it's not in the public interest, weighing up all the different various factors they have to weigh up. Um, ultimately, though, if it's an assault, then it will be um, it will, it will, each case is dependent on the facts and circumstances of each individual case. Um, I don't know if that helps answer yeah, no, your no, question. That, that, that does help. I guess then my question is where, the, where, where as a legislator, how, how would I know, passing this legislation, where that threshold will be and where it will sit? Um, and in, in that context, do you think it would have been better if the bill's aim uh, is to end the physical punishment of children to positively pass a statute that made that point? Clear. Do you think that would give more clarity um, um, that, 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 than just removing a defence? I, I, I take the point. But I, th I think our common law has actually served us quite well in this area. I think there's a good understanding of what assault is, what it means um, in terms of um, if, a, if a client comes in and I'm dealing just with a, an ordinary assault, it's, it's clear in how you explain that to the client, what we're looking at, what the issues are, what their concerns might be. Um, from a prosecutorial point of view, it's straightforward in terms of, and, and I think as well for the sheriff's judges um, or justice of the peace in terms of making those decisions, that's clear. So I think our common law does serve as well in relation to that. So I can't see that there's any issue with the way in which the bill's drafted and uh, achieving the aim of what you're, you're looking to do. So you, th you, you think parents would have sufficient foreseeability um, in, in terms of moderating their own behaviour in, in this area, even though there will be no case law um, because of the, the previous use of the, the defence, potentially? I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not aware of any case law that, 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 that sets a threshold uh, because this defence has, has been in, in, in place. Because it, it 
obviously where the defence is being used, we don't get into the question of, of that intention and whether that evil or, 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 or wicked intent was there. I think that's, do you think that's foreseeable enough? I uh, think for... it is foreseeable enough, I think, in the sense that um, there's lots of case law around assault. Obviously, it would be evolving in relation to if you were if you were bringing then children in and we would be losing those um, that defence. Um, I, 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 th I think there's merit in the common law being being the source um, of where our, our law evolves because we can progress and change things um, as time goes on. Um, I think ultimately if this law was enacted um, you, the, the advice to clients would, would be that it's it's against the law to assault your child um, and how that's interpreted then thereafter is down for, to the courts but it would be quite clear in terms of the advice that would be provided. Okay, so I've just got two further questions. Yep. Okay, they'll be relatively quick. Um, if, if you're confident that the, the common law is able to, to, to adequately define uh, assault, what, why is the common law so ambiguous when it comes to this particular defence? Why is it so ambiguous? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the law is ambiguous currently with, with this defence? In, in terms place? of reasonable chastisement yeah. as a defence, I think that is ambiguous, and I think that's why the 2003 Act, I'm obviously in part in relation to... Um, so why is the common law ambiguous for a defence, but not ambiguous around the, the actual offence? What's, what's the difference? What's the difference? I suppose it depends on what you mean by ambiguity. Um, it, it, Reasonable chastisement, I think, was broad, and I think up to a point, people were clear what that meant, um, and the courts were clear. That was tested, and it was found that actually our level was not acceptable um, in terms of the kind of international practice in relation to that, which is why we then moved to kind of tighten that up and give further clarification. But it's not that the common law wasn't unclear. I think that it was that our legal position was not the one that we wanted it to be. Um, does that? Does yeah, that, no, that, that, that perfectly, perfectly, I think, draws out the point I, I, was, I was hoping. Um, and the final question, I guess, would then be, um, Michael, uh, Michael Sheridan, the uh, Scots of the Scots Law Agent Society, had written an article um, in the past sort of week or so, I think, where he said uh, that, like recently repealed legislation, the proposed legislation uh, might not take into account the practical difficulties likely to arise. On implementation, do you know what legislation uh, he would be referring to, and, and what, he, what he's meaning there? I, I can't say that I, I do. I can't. I, I, I can't see any practical difficulties with implementation. Sorry that I can't answer that. Yeah, more clearly. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Alex Goldhampton. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, in the last session, we heard a very powerful account of a social experiment from Dr Lucy Reynolds, uh, where she talked about children learning via mimicry, about, uh, I don't know if you heard it, about uh, children who were shown a room of toys and an adult using a mallet to hit a clown, and then they were let into the room, and then they mimicked the behaviour, whereas the, uh, uh, the control group who hadn't seen the video didn't. Um, I'm really interested, particularly for the police, but this perhaps expands to the wider panel as well, um, I've heard over the years in, in arguments around this debate, people like John Carnican, formerly of the Strathclyde Violence Reduction Unit, citing the corollary between violence in the home and violence on the streets. Um, perhaps, John, you could lead off with uh, whether you think there's a view of Police Scotland that you recognise that children uh, learn via mimicry and that the um, sanction of the use of violence the, of, in the home, the legitimisation of violence in the home through physical punishment, has a causal relationship with violence on our streets. Well, let me, let me be quite straightforward. I suppose you've heard the same evidence that I've heard, um, and actually there are greater people than I to make that uh, judgment. And on page 18 of the proposal, it outlines the, the evidence that exists to demonstrate that. So I'm going on the body of evidence that has been highlighted uh, in the earlier session, that there is, appears to be a linkage between violence within the home, violence within the wider society. It's not me or Police Scotland that's making that judgment. Uh, I don't have an evidence base to bring to you today to demonstrate that. What the evidence base is, the evidence base that's already been heard by this committee is highlighted in the proposal um, and highlighted by other uh, witnesses. So, um, so that's why I go back to my original point in terms of um, does the bill uh, support 
the aim of promoting and safeguarding the health and well-being of children and, by extension, promoting the health and well-being of wider community. But actually, the evidence base seems to suggest that it does. And before I bring in the others to answer the same question, can I just ask um, what, uh, John, either your, your own view of that of Police Scotland would be to say uh, Marsha Scott from Children, Scottish Women's Aid, who has always advocated that we can't begin to eradicate domestic violence in the home while we still, as a state, allow any kind of physical punishment in our, in our homes? Well, we go back to, you know, the UK uh, appears to be a bit of an outlier in terms of accepting that uh, corporal punishment within the home remains a justifiable position. Um, it seems to be that there, are, there is an evidence base to say that actually um, the benefits of educating parents on alternative methods uh, of parenting. Um, but I think, you know, the, the evidence that's been presented by Vary in relation to the domestic abuse component it's, it's clearly got linkages in terms of violence in the home. It's not just limited to violence against children, violence against women within the home, violence against other members within the home. So, and again, I go back to the what is the evidence base to demonstrate that that has an impact on children's well-being? There seems to be an evidence base to suggest that that is, uh, that is a position. Can I invite uh, other panel members to respond to either of those questions? Yeah. Neil. Yeah, I think it's, it's fairly um, clear from from the sessions you've had already, that the overwhelming evidence suggests that this, a spectrum of violence that exists in children's lives, um, particularly within the household, um, has an impact and a, a very adverse impact on their um, well-being and outcomes. And, and that spectrum can exist from you know, very severe forms of violence to, 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 to physical punishment. Um, and I, th I think it, it's fairly um, clear from both evidence and I think people's practice that where we have examples of alternative approaches to trying to uh, parent children, where we have alternatives to the use of physical punishment, um, there's a, 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 a clear absence of uh, those ad adversities and those experiences. Um, and I suppose having listened to the, the various sessions over the last few weeks, I, I think you know there are the, the, the empirical evidence is fairly fairly stark and fairly overwhelming, uh, and. Um, and is by far in, in, in the majority. In our day-to-day -day practice in the children's hearing system, clearly children um, who um, are living in circumstances where uh, violence and aggression um, are, are predominant uh, can present with some very significant challenges and difficulties in their life. Uh, violence would be one aspect um, uh, of, of how those difficulties manifest itself for children. Um, but they are, they, are, they are significant, and I think if I asked any children's reporter on the land to, to, to tell me about um, the impact of living in, in circumstances where, there, where there's violence and physical punishment, they would be able to, to, to tell me in some detail about, about what they experience uh, in terms of the children who, 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 who they're involved with. Barry? Um, yeah, I, I, I can't really speak at length to any of the, the research, but what I can say in terms of <clears throat> Kind of practical day-to-day -day working. Um, I do a lot of criminal work and a lot of children's referral work, so to the children's hearing system, and there is a sizable crossover in terms of that, um, which I think shows something, but I, I can't speak to any kind of detailed research into the issues. Okay. And final question for me just now, convener, if I may. Um, so we're going to be uh, speaking with Professor Lazellery this afternoon. He's a, a, a an American academic who is very much a uh, opponent of this proposed legislation. And he cites uh, the example of Sweden, which um, he, he suggests there is a causal relationship between the ban on smacking in Sweden in 1979 and a 7,000% increase in juvenile rapes between then and 2010. Are you concerned that we would experience the same increase in violence and delinquency and rape amongst children and young people, if we go down the same route? So prior to coming here, I actually undertook a bit of research to determine whether there was any indication that such... So that, that the first I heard this piece of academic research was when I was sitting in the back listening to the earlier session. And actually the term suggests that there is a causal effect and 7,000 per cent increase actually is meaningless to me unless I understand what the base figures are in terms of what that is. 
However, what I would say is, from the research I've undertook, the in interaction with uh, colleagues from the Republic of Ireland, research from New Zealand, wider authorities, I don't see any evidence based to, to, to seem to suggest that that's supportive. I will, with interest, go back and read this piece of research and listen to the evidence session later on. But um, I have nothing to bring to this table to suggest that actually um, it would impact negatively. And actually, there are other research programmes that would suggest that it would impact positively. Um, and it then goes back to this point, even the, the wider view of um, increased reporting. Actually, why is increased reporting seen as a disadvantage or a poor thing with us? Actually, increased reporting might be a good thing to support parents, to support children. So, actually, um, I think um, there's, there's a body of evidence to suggest the opposite, but I will listen with interest later on with regards to the evidence session that is coming up. Anybody else? I'm not a researcher, but I did read it, and it didn't particularly make sense to me. Um, but that's just... okay. Thank you. Um, Full to me, <clears throat> Thanks, Camina. Um, in the last panel, I asked Andy Je Jeffries a uh, quite practical question, just about how um, how this change in the law, if it, if it has passed, would affect the job protection process, which obviously involves social work and police. So, John McKenzie, I'm wondering if I can ask you the same question. You've probably heard me ask it to Andy Jeffries. If a referral comes in um, and there's a joint social work and police investigation, how would it, um, if this law is passed, how would it change um, police interaction? Well, it was nice to see Andrew. Uh, I've not seen him for a number of years, and he referred to a weekly IRD meeting that he attends in Edinburgh. And actually, I used to sit every week with him at that same IRD meeting. And Andrew Jeffries highlighted to the committee it would not make any difference whatsoever in relation to the processes adopted. And I will reiterate that position. It will not make any difference. There will still be, if it's believed to be a child protection matter, there will be a multi-agency response. That's, that means that there is a three-way conversation, at least a three-way conversation. There might be other parties involved, depending on the circumstances, uh, and then an assessment of risk, uh, multi-agency approach, and safeguarding the, the child or children would be undertaken. And the removal of this defence will have absolutely no impact on the process and procedures adopted uh, by Social Work, Health and Police, as outlined within the 2014 Child Protection Guidelines. And do you think that also applies to once that process is, is, is run a reasonable course eh, about the decision of the police to, to charge or not? And I suppose that would tie in the my most substantive, eh, substantive, easy for me to say, eh, question about whether you, you, you believe that you've seen the, the, the actual um, defence used. So I have seen the defence used. There's uh, two items of case law that's within the papers that I've highlighted back in 88 and 89, the defence being used. I'm aware of the defence being used uh, during my period. Um, I, I've spent the best part of my policing career within the area of public protection. Um, and um, so, yes, I have seen the defence used, but then I go back to the point, it's a defence. It's a defence for the point of trial for somebody to determine whether there is a justifiable reason for that assault. That would not impact on the approach that we then adopt. If there is a sufficiency of evidence to indicate that a child has been assaulted, and I, and I go back to the terms that have been used within the media and within smacked and whacked actually are not that helpful terms that are used. The term assault is probably the, the more accurate term. If there is uh, an indication or evidence to support that a child has been assaulted, then that will be reported, and ultimately it will be for the Procurator Fiscal to make a decision. Um, we will determine whether there is evidence to support a charge. The Fiscal will obviously make a decision whether there is evidence in law to support uh, a case, and ultimately there would be a report to the wider concerns, or potentially a report to the report in terms of uh, the, the wider well-being uh, of the child. So, for clarity, the, the existence of the defence doesn't impact in just now or in the future on a police decision to charge a suspect? It should not impact, is what I'm saying. You know, so, the removal of the defence um, of justifiable assault <coughs> should not impact on the processes that are adopted, unless there are wider guidance documents that are associated, wider clarification notes, whether there is a Crown guidance on the matter. But it, as I have read the bill, uh, or the, the, the intended bill, it should not make any, it should not impact on on uh, the process adopted. Thanks very much. And Neil Hunter, and from a children's reporter point of view, if this if this um, 
if this bit bill is to get passed, what, what would be the, the practical and day-to-day -day implications for the way for the running of the hearing system? So as of today, the, um, the, the police and local authorities um, have a duty to consider referral to the reporter where they can uh, consider a child uh, is, is requires protection or guidance or, or, or treatment or control and where they consider um, compulsory supervision may be required for that child. And that doesn't change. And, and we don't require uh, an offence to be committed uh, for, that, for those concerns uh, to uh, relate to referral to the, the children's reporter. Um, in fact, the, um, the GERFEC approach, which has been really effective in ensuring that so many children um, have access to voluntary uh, support uh, and within their families and in their communities, um, has really enhanced uh, the ability to, to focus on those children who do need control and supervision uh, and, and guidance and treatment, and where there are uh, uh, grounds for, for uh, compulsory uh, measures. So it doesn't really change that um, the, the focus and all of those decisions uh, in relation to referral is on the best interests and the welfare of the child. Um, and that would be the, the sole determining uh, factor in terms of referral into the children's hearing system. When children reporters receive referrals, our job is to um, ascertain whether a ground referral uh, is relevant to the child's circumstances and whether there is sufficiency of evidence to establish that ground referral, um, should we be required to do that, um, and also whether it is in the child's best interests uh, to, to, for, a hearing, for a children's hearing to be arranged to, to consider uh, compulsory measures. And again, that won't change. Uh, that will be very much focused on each individual child, their circumstances, the background to the referral, um, and um, the focus on the child's welfare. Um, and ostensibly, the process around child protection, around GERFEC, around referral to the reporter remains the same. Do you think there's any merit in, um, and I mentioned this at the last panel as well, do you think there's any merit in the, the argument that we heard um, when the committee was in Sky last week that if this bill is passed that it may um, inadvertently um, be, be more disadvantageous for families, for, um, for, for families from certain uh, backgrounds who perhaps have already got agency involvement such as social workers and police and, and are maybe involved in the hearing system? I suppose I go back to Andy Jeffrey's point earlier: is that you know we, in terms of our public um, um, promotion of the new legislation uh, and public promotion of um, positive parenting, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll need to work harder in some areas in some communities than, than in others. But I don't see um, any particular um, community or, or group uh, being disadvantaged by this. The, the main beneficiaries of this uh, proposal are children. Um, and if we need to work harder to get the message across to adults and those with a parenting or caring responsibility, in particular areas of society, then that's exactly what we need to do. No, I'm going to bring in um, Mary Fee has a question on, on specific equality groups. Yeah, th thank you. And my, my question um, um, follows on quite nicely from the line of questioning that Fulton McGregor um, has opened up, and that's about um, specific equality groups. And I suppose if I could maybe start with um, Neil, and then maybe I'd be uh, John, you might want to um, come in on this, because I'd be keen to know if you have any evidence that would suggest, or are you aware of any evidence that would suggest that specific groups are more likely to be subjected to, to physical um, chast chast chastisement, that's a difficult word to say as well, whether that's um, children and young people that have um, physical or um, mental limitations or indeed children from a care experience background? The main evidence I'm aware of is the vulnerability of children with a disability who uh, may be particularly more vulnerable to uh, experiencing uh, physical uh, assault and abuse. Um, we have done some work in our own research in SCRA around awareness of broader child protection uh, procedures and expectations in uh, black and minority ethnic communities, um, which we conducted about two years ago. 
that showed a, a lower level of awareness of, of child protection uh, arrangements and procedures and protections and perhaps in other groups. And we've continued to, to do a piece of work at national and local level to, to think about how we can promote uh, understanding and awareness um, of um, child protection and child um, uh, um, concerns in, in those communities. I'm not aware of any other uh, areas or, or populations or equality groups mm. that, that would be um, that would stick out in my mind in terms of being disproportionately uh, affected by uh, the proposal. Um, and as I say, the main beneficiaries of this are, are children. Mm. Uh, and again, there may be some further work to be done in some communities or some, within some mm. equality groups um, that will be uh, more of a challenge for us. But I think the challenge is there to be met. OK, that's very helpful. John? Um, <clears throat> Beyond what Neil's saying, I probably don't have a great deal more to add. Um, I've not seen the wider equality impact assessment that has been undertaken in relation to the bill uh, and any work that's going to be undertaken in relation to a wider equality impact assessment. That's clearly going to be a piece of work that has to be carried out. Um, there is a that is clear from evidence across uh, the world that actually raising awareness is a really important component of introducing the bill. Uh, and that, again, falls, again, I would suggest, on the policymaker, the legislator, to ensure that there's clear communication. And I think there's evidence and suggestion that within the Republic Ireland there's some lessons to be learned in terms of that communication process. And there's also clear elements about <coughs> setting parameters of what the difference between restraint and uh, assault is uh, in terms of, and it goes back to the questions that you had earlier, I think there's an experience in New Zealand in relation to learning from that. But um, beyond what Neil's saying, I have nothing else to add in terms of the, the impact across uh, a wider equality, uh, from an equality perspective. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Barry, did you wish to add anything to that? Are you? OK, thank you. Um, Annie Wells. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, just ask the same question which I asked this morning's panel to get your thoughts on. Do you think that the bill will criminalise parents and lead to an increase in prosecutions? And are there any evidence of this to any member of the... or all? I may. Um, again, I tried to find out um, through a bit of research and looking at the evidence sessions already heard. Um, so the evidence seems to suggest there is no indication that it results in increased prosecutions. There is a suggestion that it results in increased reporting, which is, is different. Uh, and in terms <coughs> of the reporting, uh, and again, you go back to New Zealand over a two-year period, I understand that there was an increase of 36 reports over a two-year. How indicative or um, or useful that figure is, uh, probably it's not that useful, but it gives an indication of the numbers within uh, experience within New Zealand. Um, will the bill criminalise parents? Well, I go back to my original point. The bill is a removal of a statute of defence of justifiable assault. So I cannot see how that then in itself would criminalise parents in as much as um, we have an opportunity to communicate wider with parents, to highlight what the values of Scotland and wider organisations are in the hope for, um, for the children within Scotland. Um, so I don't, I don't believe there's any evidence that even suggests across uh, other countries that have went down this route that it criminalises parents. Thank you. Anyone else? Mary? Yes. Um, I, I think it's important to say that um, I, I think the, the ethos of the bill is about changing public attitudes. It's not about increasing mm -hmm. prosecutions. Um, and um, ultimately, I, I'm just reiterating that I think it, it will increase potentially um, in reports to the police, because if you, if you have any public awareness campaign around an issue, then that might be a likely effect. Um, but it's back to the point I made earlier. It's down to prosecutorial discretion as to how they then proceed. No, I, I can't see any um, evidence that would suggest um, an increase in criminal prosecution against um, parents. Um, I think the long term, we should see the benefit of this bill um, and its proposals in terms of recalibrating our approach to how we uh, support and rear children in this country. Um, I don't see any um, real evidence that um, state intervention in family life will increase as a result of this bill. Um, and the reason I say that is because our focus is on best interests of the child. Um, and in each part of the child protection and the child welfare system, there is discretion and judgment built into it, um, 
which I think takes us away from having those very binary uh, or hard lines about uh, prosecution or not. Our interest is in children's welfare and protection, um, and we're able to make the best decisions we can make uh, with, that kind of, with that kind of guiding um, uh, aspect. So I, I don't really see um, any evidence um, or any, any, any concerns from, from people within my own organisation that this will lead to, to increased prosecution of parents or increased state interference in family life. And just following on from, from that, just your comments there, there is a concern though from some, from some that the bill will interfere in private family life. Is this concern justified? And obviously you, you've kind of answered that, Neil, but I wonder if anyone else well, can I just, add? I think one of the really important roles that the children's reporter performs is to make sure that there's not inappropriate state interference in family life, and that any interference in family life has to be proportionate and justified, and has to be based on evidence. I've got no, I would reiterate the points that uh, uh, Neil's highlighted, and I would go back to some of the points Andrew Jeffries mentioned earlier on about the uh, on that very subject about uh, interference with family life. I, I don't believe there, there's any evidence to demonstrate that that would be the position. The only thing I would say is, is that the, the, the right to family life um, that's obviously within Article 8, it, it, it's not an absolute right. There are, there are limitations on that, and, and I think what this bill is talking about um, fits within what's achievable within that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, <clears throat> Although we've heard from uh, various witnesses that said that, um, well, certainly the evidence from other countries says that there's not been uh, an, an increase in prosecutions, but there may well be an increase in reporting. Do you expect any increased burden on public services as a result of that? Um, so... My understanding is there will be an increase, or my professional opinion and judgment is there will be an increase in reporting. The extent of that increased reporting is hard to determine, to be fair, based on the evidence that's been presented uh, from New Zealand, the Republic of Ireland, and I use those two as an example, based on uh, the system being founded in common law. Uh, I've also looked at other areas such as Sweden. Um, Professional judgment would suggest that there will be an increase in reporting. In terms of the size of that increase in reporting, it's unclear. Uh, it would appear that uh, New Zealand, as I've said earlier, have not had a significant impact. Uh, and I suppose that goes back to the financial impact assessment and statement that's been provided. It's hard to actually determine what the financial impact would be from a public service perspective. Um, and I would suggest that there still requires some analysis in relation to what the real impact has been within other jurisdictions such as the Republic of Ireland. So the evidence is presented as a be minimal impact, but actually I think there are some gaps within that evidence that's presented and it's worthy of looking at further evidence to understand what has been the impact. It has been suggested that um, there's a high probability that it will save money further down the line and that this should be looked at as preventative spend. Is that something that you would agree with? Well, I would tend to uh, agree with this on, on two points. I'm not convinced that um, an increase in reporting should be seen as a disadvantage. It should be as seen as an opportunity to support uh, parents understand any risks that are associated within the family environment and hence may be seen as a preventative approach to then reduce spend in the future. So that may be uh, a reasonable argument with an element of rationale behind it. Um, I suppose the second bit to, to that is, um, you know, understanding uh, the sort of savings from prevention has always been very difficult to, to achieve because you actually have to try and understand what the baseline figure is and actually we don't have an understanding of what that baseline number is in terms of um, at this moment and, and that's been the challenge in, in the Republic as well I understand. So I think there is an element of, uh, sort of rationale around the bit about it's, it could prevent uh, costs in the future uh, but again I believe that there is probably some further analysis that's required we undertake to clearly understand that position? Yeah. If, if there were 
an increase in reporting, um, I think it's likely to be uh, fairly small and fairly short-lived. And if it, if it leads to families in need of support and help being identified earlier, um, that's likely to be a good thing. Um, we've already heard this morning about how our public services currently line up uh, around the principles of GovTech uh, to get alongside families. Um, so there's, a, I think, a, a possibility, if there were a short uh, increase in, in uh, reports, there, there, are, there could be some positive benefits for that um, in terms of early elective interventions with families rather than waiting for uh, circumstances to become acute, uh, where, where agencies like my own may have to step in and can consider uh, more formal uh, interventions. Um, in the long term, I've said I think this is about recalibrating how we bring up our children in Scotland. Um, so I don't see any long-term uh, financial consequences or um, long-term strain on the public purse. I see opportunities for earlier and effective intervention in family, with families working alongside them. Okay. Don't have anything to add to that. May I just add one additional point, just in support of an earlier comment? I suppose if you go to the Swedish example, um, my understanding is um, there was an 83% acceptance that corporal punishment within the home was, um, was not justifiable, and then the introduction of legislation resulted in now a 97% uh, position where the population do not believe corporal punishment is justified within the home. So actually by even introducing or having a clear public message will then present an understanding to the wider public and a social acceptance, I would anticipate from the evidence that actually corporal punishment in the home is not acceptable. So that then might not have, as Neil said, the long run approach might not be impactive um, to services. Um, yes, yeah, certainly one of the aims that we've talked about in previous um, evidence sessions is to go for cultural change, and, and that's what we've um, spoken about um, here today as well. And one of our previous panels said that the aim is to just stop adults lifting their hands to children full stop, um, whether that's assault or whether it's, and, and we've also heard this described in another panel, as a light tap on the hand as part of loving chastisement, chastisement or, or, or punishment. Um, how will the police, because you talked about setting parameters between restraint and assault, how will we set that parameters between what is viewed in some communities as a loving tap on the hand? And if you are called out to these sort of instances, how will you determine what's in the public interest? Well, I suppose I would then, uh, you know, so let me start by saying, actually, again, it's, in, it's the role of the legislator to make sure that there's clear public messaging of what's acceptable and not. So that is, that's a, position, that is a clear position. In terms of um, making a determination of what is a tap on the hand or what is an assault, actually... That will be born from an evidence gathering position that I've highlighted earlier, whereby we would have a discussion about how to approach, um, if it was highlighted as a child protection concern, make a determination what the evidence base is, and then make a, a, a determination whether there was a sufficiency of evidence to justify the term assault. So actually that won't change any. But let me be clear, in all my years in the public protection arena, I've never heard anybody reporting or engaging with the police about somebody who get a tap on the hand. So actually, we, we are talking about, um, there seems to be, a, you know, using examples such as a tap on the hand by a parent probably is not a useful example to provide when actually what we're talking about is assault on children. Thank you. Um, and just one uh, final question, again, evidence that, that we've had in, um, that, that basically says if we're doing an awareness raising campaign, an education campaign, if this work is happening now with positive parenting and looking for alternatives to um, smacking, do you think that we're already moving towards that as a society? And if we are, 
is there a need for legislation? Why don't we just do the awareness raising and the public education campaign on its own? I think social attitudes have changed. Um, I think it's changed slowly. Um, I think um, the continued um, presence of a, a, a justifiable uh, assault on children um, well, is holding us back in terms of absolute clarity about expectation and about conduct of, of parents and our conduct towards children. Um, so uh, public awareness campaigns, I think, um, can really help, but with this, this kind of really ambiguous aspect of law uh, continuing to, to be present in Scottish society, the, the pace of change, I think, will always be hampered by that. So I think, again, come back to this whole issue about, about rebasing, recalibrating uh, what we expect in terms of the well-being and health and, and, and development of Scotland's children uh, will accelerate um, the positive progress we've made. I'd also say, you know, I think um, I've spent many of my, um, much of my career in, in social work and health care, uh, and I've seen some really good developments around um, programmes in our communities across Scotland, whether it's Triple P or whether it's Mellow Parenting, and uh, delivery uh, by um, services such as health visitors uh, and others. You know, there's a real sense of, of um, a lot of that apparatus being able to support families being currently in place. And I think a, a, a change in the law, a, a reset of the tone, uh, will, will, will help us um, further in terms of delivery of support to families need it most. I suppose I would reiterate Neil's opening comment about, um, I believe, the sort of social attitudes have and are changing. Um, I then go back to, I'm taken by the evidence presented earlier on, that actually that sort of juxtaposed position of having one in law saying one thing and then in actually in guidance or public messaging saying another thing, actually I'm not convinced based on what I've heard that that is a helpful position. Um, and is either one thing or the other? I would probably support that view. I think an awareness campaign that says this is what, what we want you to do, but the law says another. I think the law does give um, people clear messages as to what um, we're looking for in terms of their parenting. And um, I, I, I think if your intention is to make social change, you, you also need the law to support that so that you can actually communicate that effectively to people. Um, and it is confusing. I, mean, I, I have a client at the moment, but I sat with her watching a police interview of her ex-partner talking about um, what, what he'd done. And um, her view was that he, he'd, he'd admitted to an assault, and he had, but there was clearly a defence there and so of reasonable chastisement. And so for her watching that, it was clear that he'd admitted to it. He'd broken the law and he'd admitted to that, but he actually hadn't. And I think all of that's even really confusing within the reality of what families are looking at. So if you're sort of saying, ultimately she had the view that smacking in any shape and form was already illegal, but it's not. And so I think you need to be able to say to people both things at the same time, if that's actually what you're wanting to do. Thank you. Um, Gordon Lindhurst, if you have Thank you, Convener. Um, perhaps a question for John McKenzie. Um, just, we, we heard from an Irish senator this morning who's involved in the legislation there, and, um, and she said there's, there's no um, sanctions, was the word she used, on uh, the legislation, the way they introduced it there. Um, the Spice Paper commissioned by the committee, which uh, sets out in Sweden, said, uh, likewise, no sanctions there. Now, um, we don't have in our system, as they do in New Zealand, for example, a statute of limitations that would relate to this sort of um, potential offence. Um, and lots of different systems, a very different mixed approaches to different things. Sweden, of course, has a statute of limitations. So um, should we not, in the bill, make clear and um, spell out in black and white, as you have, or one has in Sweden, Ireland, New Zealand, uh, these rights that parents and children and families have, which we don't have spelt out in our law and this bill doesn't seek to do. Because I think part of the concern is, uh, as you'll know, we have a high percentage of prison population in this country. Uh, we tend to approach the criminal law very differently 
than in other countries. I mean, we may be seeking to try to move the approach differently with the raising of the age of criminal responsibility, but is this something we should make clear in the bill uh, on different points so that we have the same rights in Scotland as they do in these other countries, parents and children? I listened with interest um, at the earlier session, and um, I confess that um, to answer your question in any sort of structured manner, I would have to go back and have a check to see what the, the position is in the Republic of Ireland uh, and in Sweden. Um, however, um, I suppose I go back to some of my opening comments. Um, it is for the legislator to make the decision what is in this bill based on the body of evidence. I do not have anything constructive that I could add to the question that you raised because I would want to go and research that point that you have made. Um, but again, I would reiterate that actually, based on whatever evidence and body of evidence, that is a decision for the legislator to make. I do not know, convener, if the other two panellists could be allowed to comment. Of if course, they have. if they have something they wish to say. Very briefly, I would say that I, I think you, you have different legal systems that do things mm. in different ways, but if they reach the same aim and have the same objective, mm. I do not think it really matters too much. I think we do have um, a good system of common law in this country, and I think um, there is there's no reason to move away from that. I may have misunderstood your question, but um, anything that sets out clarity for uh, parents in terms of their rights and responsibilities uh, would be really helpful, but I don't think we necessarily need to enshrine that in, in law. I think um, parental responsibilities, parental rights um, are something that um, we need to be able to, to be very clear in terms of promoting understanding of and what we expect of parents in relation to their conduct towards children, and, and particularly in relation to their conduct and uh, in, in, in ever-changing societal expectations. And I think this bill uh, creates new uh, positive societal expectations into, into, in relation to parental conduct. And John Finney wished to come in here. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I don't have a question. It's just as a point of clarification to uh, an aspect that uh, Mr Linter raised there just now. Of course, it's important to have clarity, and the clarity about transitional arrangements is covered in paragraphs 118 to 120 of the policy memorandum, just for the record. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK, that brings us to the, the, the end of our session today. Can I thank you um, very much, panel, for your, for your evidence. The committee has already agreed to consider evidence in private, so I now move into private session and ask the public gallery to clear. After consideration of evidence in private, the committee will reconvene not before 1pm in committee room 1, where we will take evidence via video conference from Professor Robert Lazzeri. Thank you.